All right, so it's 12 o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. I've got the QR code up here so that you can request your CME and MOC credit for Grand Rounds. Um, I'll leave that up there for just a second while I say welcome to Medical Grand Rounds, the University of Colorado. Really happy that we are back in person. We will continue to offer online sessions all throughout the year. As a little teaser in the upcoming weeks on August 30th, so next Wednesday, we've got Dr. Katherine Dickinson. She's coming from the School of Public Health here at the University of Colorado to talk about environmental justice and the impact on human health, which I think should be really fascinating. And then two weeks from now on September 6th, we're going to hear from Dr. Dwayne Peterson in the Division of Rheumatology. He's going to talk about his ECHO education program, which is great. It's a really novel concept. If you haven't seen this as a new way to, really, to reach patients and also our community practitioners. Um, as a reminder, we do have credit for all of our talks this year. Um, and then questions will come from our live audience as well as the chief medical residents. Uh, we'll keep an eye on the Zoom Q&A feature. Uh, now I really am very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Donald Neese. Uh, Dr. Neese is a professor of medicine in the Department of Family Medicine. He serves as the Director of Community Engagement and Health Equity for the Colorado Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, our CTCSI, and he's also the Green Edelman Chair for Practice-Based Research. Dr. Neese did his undergrad work at the University of Kansas, where he was also a medical student, one in Lawrence, one's in Kansas City. Uh, he was then an intern and a resident in family medicine at the University Medical University of South Carolina, MUSC, uh, and then went on to do advanced training in faculty development as a fellow at the University of North Carolina. Dr. Neese has really been a leader in the Department of Family Medicine and also across our entire campus for quite some time now. He served as the Vice Chair of Research as well as the Vice Chair of Community uh, Engagement prior to his current leadership positions. In these roles and others, he's maintained a career as an actively funded primary researcher. His work is currently funded by the NIH, NCI, PCORI, as well as the CTCSI publishing over 2,200 pieces of scholarship, 2,000 would be really impressive, uh, and 100 original articles. He is a sought after national speaker. And of course, he really is a leader in this space on campus, which given the work that he does, extends far beyond our campus walls. Uh, so now it really is a pleasure for me to welcome Dr. Don Neese talking about reclaiming Verkow, medicine as social science and community engagement for health equity. Dr. Neese. All right. Thanks so much. Wow, I'm gonna have to live up to that introduction there. Um, so yeah, we're gonna talk about social medicine. Um, we're, I think most of us, uh, at least those of us that are physicians are familiar with Virchow and Virchow's triad, that sort of thing. But this is another thing that Virchow brought that I think is really important. And we're gonna step through this. The other thing I'm gonna say is community engagement is one of these things that um, I like to think it's, it's kind of gotten buzzword status. And that's a good thing. Um, people are more aware of it, but there's actually some science behind why it's important and why, she, why we should be thinking about it and, and how we should be engaging with it. So I'm looking forward to sharing this with you all. And it's just an honor to be able to present to the Department of Medicine. So thanks for the invite. And I'll skip over that. Um, just disclosures. So um, I serve on a board, um, the Foundation for Psychosomatic and Social Medicine, uh, which is actually a Swiss foundation related to my work with balance groups, which is another piece of um, my professional interest. Um, as mentioned, I've got funding currently from NHLBI, um, PCORI, and NCATS, and I have no conflicts to declare. So just as an overview, we're gonna start off um, with introducing you all to this other piece of Dr. Virchow um, and how he got involved in this notion of social medicine. Um, I'm gonna do a COVID-19 case study. So to kind of ground us in a, in a clinical case. And we're gonna talk about complexity, complex versus complicated issues, because that is really what's at the heart of health equity and also how community engagement can help us navigate that complexity. And then finally, what's our part in this and tell you about some resources that we have within the CCTSI to help out. Learning objectives, gotta have learning objectives. Um, describing the differences between complicated and complex issues identify complex health issues that benefit from engaging 
with impacted communities. And then finally, just hopefully you'll be able to describe some approaches to authentically engaging with communities that are impacted by these health equity issues. All right, so hopefully everybody's on the right flight today and we'll dive in. So this is Dr. Virchow. This is a portrait that I found online, probably dates to his time when he was leading the Institute of Pathology at the Charte um, in Berlin. And um, he was born in 1821, died in 1902. Uh, trained in Berlin and uh, taught both in Würzburg and Berlin uh, at the Charte, as I mentioned. Um, still to this day, very much a, a public hospital in the middle of Berlin, really interesting place. I had the privilege of visiting there a number of years ago. Um, and Virchow, I think with, with some justification is considered to be the father of modern pathology. Um, he had this famous quote that all cells come from cells, and we're familiar with Virchow's triad around coagulation and coagulopathies, Virchow's node, but then there's also this aspect of social medicine, which probably we would put under the banner of public health maybe today in a lot of ways, but it also embraces policy and other things. So how did he come to this? Well, Back in, back in 1847, he was sent to Upper Silesia by the Prussian government. So Upper Silesia is this little corner of what at that time was Prussia. Um, it's now Poland. Um, and there was a rampant typhus epidemic that was going on there at the time. And Virchow was incredibly impressed with the fact that this was really, I mean, talk about a health disparity. It was obvious that folks who were living in poverty because of sanitation issues, access to clean water were heavily impacted by this. And he was really thought it was important to describe this. He issued this report on the typhus epidemic in Upper Silesia back in 1848. And he, within that report, has this, this statement that medicine is a social science um, and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. Pretty radical notion, but I think echoes some of the things that we've been hearing um, in recent years in terms of issues around health equity and um, particularly uh, since the COVID pandemic and George Floyd. So really foreshadowed a lot of this. Um, he was quite politically active. It actually got him fired from the Charte for a while, um, but he got, got himself rehired. So really interesting guy. So let's transition now to talking about a case study from, from COVID, from the pandemic. So, and really this for me highlights the impact of language and language justice um, in healthcare. And I'm gonna tell you about, uh, we'll use the name Juan for this gentleman that uh, was a, a middle-aged migrant farm worker in the San Luis Valley. Um, and I'll tell you about the San Luis Valley a little bit as we go, go on here. Juan was Spanish speaking, but his primary language was Canjobal. So Canjobal is a Mayan dialect that's spoken by this Guatemalan immigrant population in the San Luis Valley. Um, there's a large community there, had the privilege of being at one of their feast day celebrations um, this year, um, really interesting group. And most of them are working in the mushroom farms. Um, the mushroom farms in the San Luis Valley are in these enclosed, large enclosed spaces where they cultivate these. And Juan was working in one of those. And he developed symptoms of cough, muscle aches, some fever, and presented to a valley-wide health system, that's the FQHC system down in the San Luis Valley, for testing, because he was worried. So back in those days, rapid testing hadn't it wasn't widely available. And so he got the results a day later. 
They were actually given to him in Spanish, so that, that was good. But what was communicated to him was that he was positivo. Now, Juan understood that to mean you've got a good result. And so he thought, okay, good result. I don't have COVID. Wonderful. So with that, he thought he was negative. And he went back to work at the mushroom farm. And that resulted in COVID spread to more than 50 other workers, families as a result. And one actually died a week and a half later. So huge impact from this issue of language and how things were communicated. Um, and I learned about this story through some of my own work down um, in the San Luis Valley with our Colorado SEAL program, which I'll describe later, but um, quite, a, quite a story there. The San Luis Valley, if you're not familiar with it, is in South Central Colorado. Um, if you've been to the sand dunes, the sand dunes are right here. Um, beautiful national park. I really encourage a visit. Um, Alamosa is sort of the big, big city in the San Luis Valley, but you can see it. It encompasses a pretty large area, about the size of Connecticut, actually. Um, it's ringed by mountains um, and has a very diverse Latino, Hispanic population that includes this Guatemalan community. But the overall poverty rate's relatively high, so 20 to 25%. So um, lots of economic struggles down there. Um, it's a fairly dry region um, and jobs are not, there's not a lot of them. So just looking at some COVID statistics, um, this is the map of Colorado, but hopefully, whoops, hopefully you can recall back to this and sort of transpose that onto the six county region down here. You can see a lot of darker shaded counties um, in the San Luis Valley. And if we look at vaccination rates, those are also relatively low. Um, so you can see some light green actually trending down into this kind of 40 to 50% uh, vaccination rate. And this is the most recent data that we have from CDPHE. Okay, so hopefully I've made a case for the connection between health equity and some of the things that we think about today as social determinants of health. I'm gonna transition a little bit to this notion of complexity and how that feeds into this. So Karl Popper was an Austrian British philosopher. Um, actually, coincidentally, as I was putting these slides together, I realized he died just as, or he was born just as Virchow was dying in 1902. And Popper weighed in on a lot of things as philosophers do but he also talked about this notion of complexity and his famous analogy was that things that are complex are like clouds. Things that are complicated are like clocks. So what he meant by that was that, you know, a clock, if it stops running, and we're talking about a mechanical clock here, not, not one of our modern um, digital clocks, but a mechanical clock, you can take it apart, a skilled, watchmaker or clockmaker can find what's gone wrong. Was it a spring or something? They can replace that or they can fix it and put it back together and the clock works. Great. Clouds are not like that. Clouds are complex. Um, and for us in medicine, I think we've made tremendous advances by working on complicated issues infectious disease, um, think about you know, treating heart disease. Those are complicated issues. We've got medications, we've got lots of things that can help with that. COVID, there were complicated parts of that, the development of vaccines, that sort of thing, but actually getting those vaccines into arms, much more of a cloud type problem and particularly when you figure in 
the fact of social determinants and that sort of thing. So that's, the, that's kind of the background here for complexity. This is another complex problem. This is a, a map of all of the factors that figure in, that have an impact on an individual's obesity. This was put together over in the UK back in 2007. And I don't expect you to be able to see these things, but they're kind of grouped into domains. So here we've got food production, food consumption, that makes sense, social psychology. So there's evidence that obesity is actually has a social component, very interesting um, stuff. Individual psychology, um, physical environment. We all, I think, are familiar with the fact if you've got access to places where you can walk or exercise that are safe, that's important. Um, but then there's the individual motivation around that. And then finally, we get down to the area that is our comfort zone, physiology, right? Um, but if you look at the big picture, this is really a complex issue. So I wanna make the point that framing things as being complex can actually be helpful for us um, rather than being overwhelming. And um, I'm gonna tell you about Gene Bolton here. I got to hear Dr. Bolton speak this past summer in the UK. Um, she's got a very cool website, embracingcomplexity.com. But um, Jean talks about this in terms of the complexity calls into question this notion of whether the world behaves like a machine, like a clock, and it's predictable, divided into parts, et cetera. And she also had this framing, which I thought was really helpful in terms of thinking about ontologies, epistemologies, and methodologies. So if we think about this in terms of complexity, complexity is really an ontology. What's the nature of things? Are they like machines or are they more like those, those clouds? Um, what that then helps us to understand is, okay, how can we understand them? Is our understanding gonna be based on, again, taking things apart or do we need to apply some different kinds of things to understand that. And then finally, how's that gonna drive our methods? So that's why I think this is really helpful. And just to kind of draw a line under that, um, this was a nice paper that came out in 2019 about um, the health equity measurement framework, which I think is, is really cool um, as a way to measure social inequities in health. But the authors had this, this nice quote here that says identifying where do I intervene effectively to promote health equity has to come from an acknowledgement of the underlying complex causal structure. Um, we can't approach it as there's gonna be a quick fix. This is a complex issue. So it's darn overwhelming though, when you're dealing with complex stuff. Where in the world do you start? Um, which way is up? Um, which way are we going? And can we even, can we even reliably measure things? Um, those, are, those are good questions. So that's going to take me to my next piece, which is another really interesting framework called the Kynefin framework. So Kynefin is a Welch word. Um, I'm not going to try and tell you what it means, um, but this was coined by Dave Snowden. Dave um, was the director of IBM's European Institute of Knowledge Management. And he came up with this as a, as a sense-making tool. So a way to help folks figure out how to approach different kinds of problems. And mostly this was in you know, organizational stuff because um, that was Dave's domain, but I think it applies really nicely to what we're talking about. So again, if we are in this domain of thinking about complicated versus complex, Snowden's model would say that in a complicated problem, there are governing constraints. Things tend to be tightly coupled around those. So you can look at cause and effect. And that drives us to methods that are you know, sensing, sort of understanding what's going on there, analyzing that and responding. And Snowden says, 
this is where good practice or best practices are really helpful. So, you know, a, a lot of the stuff that many of us have trained on in terms of quality improvement really, I think, falls into this domain. You know, how can we kind of work this territory to improve quality from the standpoint of, you know, getting antibiotics to the floor in a timely fashion, those kinds of things. When we get into this complex domain though, the constraints, there are some constraints there, but they're very loosely coupled and they may be coupled in comp complex ways. Making sense of things is really about sort of probing different areas, sensing what kind of response you get and then trying to develop a response based on that. And Snowden calls this emergent practice. So it tends to be iterative. Um, it tends to be a thing that really requires us to have as many feelers out as possible. And <clears throat> Snowden further defined it, these in this vertical axis here of, these are things which, you know, it's, it's known versus knowable. These are things that, you know, we can know and have some certainty about. And this side, we're looking at patterns. We're really trying to sense this from a pattern recognition standpoint. And so, again, going back to obesity or other kinds of issues, they're beyond complicated, but most of the time we're not in this chaotic space. Again, it's not about what's known or knowable. It's about looking for patterns, using this probe, sense, respond uh, type of approach, because the problem itself doesn't necessarily tell us where to start. So you might need to be informed by other information. So, you know, if we take this back to obesity, when you're dealing with a complex problem, where you start really isn't the question, it's how you start. And that involves being open to possibilities and discovery, being aware of what you don't know, keeping your eyes open for those patterns, probing, sensing, responding, and I think this is really the essence of engagement. So here we go, community engagement. Um, this is a picture of our patient advisory group for one of our practice-based research networks um, here in Denver. So what is community engagement? It's helpful to have a definition. And this is, this is the best one I've seen so far. This is, um, going to come out with the third edition of the CDC's principles of community engagement, um, a text that's been out there for a long time. It's just this third edition is about to be released. But what they say is community engagement is an ongoing, evolving process of multi-directional communication with and for people to solve the problems and address the concerns that matter to them. The process should be durable, long-lasting, and equitable to all who participate. The ultimate goal is to influence social action, programs, and practices for the betterment of the community. I think that's awesome. Um, and this is what our community partners say. <laughs> this really is about nothing for us without us. Um, and I'm just going to, let me go back here. I want to focus, spend a little bit of time, these core principles, um, these are core principles that came from the National Academy of Medicine. They released a, a report last February around community engagement and health equity that included these. And I just want to run through these really quickly to kind of tell you how I interpret this. So co-equal. So what's that mean? So that's really means that when I, when I go out into community, I'm bringing my expertise as a physician, I bring my expertise as a researcher, I know about methods, I know how to do surveys, I know how to, to run focus groups, how to convene folks, but I may know very little about what's actually going in that community. That's a different kind of expertise that's just as valuable. And so acknowledging that is really important that I'm bringing my stuff, folks from the community are bringing their stuff and together that's where the magic happens. And that's really then leads right into co-creation. Um, 
there's a quote that I really like about community engagement that community engagement ends with an answer rather than outreach, which starts with an answer. And that's where most of our academic work has been traditionally, but engagement involves co-creation, ongoing. Um, it's not a one and done. It's not, we're doing this project and once the funding's over, we're out. Um, community engagement requires a long-term commitment. Shared governance, um, this can get really messy, uh, I will admit, but it's also can be so important in giving the community voice into how we're actually doing things. I've been proven wrong so many times, I, you know, um, including just Monday evening when, you know, folks had some really good input on how we should do some programs that I needed to listen to. Um, Multi-knowledge, that really refers to the fact that there are different ways of understanding things. So um, from a researcher's standpoint, I think about that as, you know, it's not just enough to do a survey. We also may need to do some focus groups. We may need to do some interviews. We may need to do some story mapping, other things like that, um, to tap into different ways that people know and can describe things. Equitably financed. Um, I'm getting paid to go out and engage with folks. It's part of my job. Are those folks getting paid to, to come from their side? Um, because that's important too. They're taking time from their families, from their work, whatever. Um, so that equitable financing is really important. Things being culturally centered. I'll show you some examples of this later, but um, there's this concept that I really like from anthropology about high, con high context versus low context cultures. Um, everybody in this room, we're, we're from a low context culture, which means that you're, gonna, you're likely to believe me because I'm a professor and I've got, I've got credentials. My cultural background is less important. In a high context culture, it's the opposite. That cultural background, and can I speak using idioms and metaphors that come from that culture? Am I using images that resonate with folks from that culture? That has a lot to do with whether people are gonna believe the information. So you'll see how that comes into play in some of our work later. Inclusivity, I think that's fairly obvious, bi-directional. Um, there's learning happening on both sides with this work. And then finally, trust. Trust is never something that we can take for granted. It's something that we're always working to maintain and build. And that's, that's obviously important with this work as well. So you can scan that QR code if you're interested in going to the NAM report. The thing that I really like about this is they tied community engagement to a progressive sort of way of how this can help you move through work in a community through strengthened partnerships and alliances, expanded knowledge, improved health and healthcare policies and programs, and finally to thriving communities. Just this summer, they've also released a very comprehensive set of measures that can be used to guide your work in communities. Um, and I would really recommend that to you as well if you're interested in taking on this work because measurement is important as part of the learning process and a part of that iterative, are we, are we making progress? Are we doing this right? So getting back to this complexity issue, community engagement can really serve as your compass. Um, it can guide your starting point. It can help you understand what are the outcomes that are really important to that community. Um, and when you're looking at measures, it can, it can help you understand those as well. We've done some really interesting work with our current PCORI project where we knew the domains of kind of things that we wanted to measure. We had some fairly specific outcomes, but 
with our advisory group, we actually went through, okay, we've got four different measures that look at this particular thing. Let's look at them together. Which one's gonna make most sense for folks? Um, that was a great process. So our part in this involves a lot of humility that recognizing other forms of expertise and it can sometimes be liberating to know that we don't have to have all the answers, but we can work together to end with an answer. One other thing that I think is important for us to think about when we're engaging with communities is how much are we willing to seed? How much power are we willing to seed? How much are we really willing? How far are we really will, willing to go? And it's important to be upfront about that. You know, sometimes we've only got limited degrees of freedom. The funder may say, you know, you got to do this. When we started with our Colorado SEAL program, you know, it was about vaccines and vaccine hesitancy. Our community partners had other issues that they were interested in. And we had to say, okay, we hope we can get to those maybe in future years. Thank goodness this year, we're gonna be able to do that. But we had some constraints from that standpoint. So thinking about this, this comes from a group in Australia, but I, I like the clarity of it in terms of, you know, are we engaging with folks because we want them to inform us? Are we getting consultation, which means that, you know, we're gonna keep you informed, listen, acknowledge your concerns, and provide feedback on how that influenced things. Are we moving more into involvement where, again, we're starting to get into co-creation along the spectrum with collaboration? Or are we really at the point where we're really trying to empower the community? And I think about that in terms of work where we're building community capacity and really empowering them to be equal partners at the table. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our Colorado SEAL project and how we put some of this into active use. So SEAL is a NIH, NHLBI funded program. It started um, in the fall of 2020. Um, our funding began in the spring of 2021. There are 21 SEAL teams across the country. Um, which we're proud to be one of those. And NIH's mandate was, let's focus on COVID-19 misinformation and vaccine hesitancy. And they asked us to, to use community engagement as a way to do that. So we wanted to use robust methods. We came up with this notion that we, we wanted to really ground our work in our partner community. So we developed this new role called a community connector. Our community connectors are hired by us. They contract with us and they're like our study coordinators almost in each of these communities. They've hired community data collectors to collect survey data. Um, they've helped us find participants for our bootcamp translation work. And they've also served this really valuable role of telling us, okay, yeah, Don, I know you wanted to do that in so many weeks. Let me tell you, we're not gonna be able to do that. It's gonna take longer. Um, or uh, we actually, we're gonna need translation um, to do this. And we really want a medical expert who can speak our language if at all possible. Okay. Um, We'll do our best. We, we actually were able to find a Somali physician who could be a medical expert for our Somali community. That was amazing, um, but it's pushed us in some really good directions. Um, and then we use, you know, obviously community participants, but there's so many points along this journey with these communities where without them, we could have never navigated the complexity of this work. This is an example over there on the right of one of the products of one of our bootcamp translations. And this is, came out of our urban American Indian Alaska Native community. And 
right? Just looking at it, you can see the cultural relevance of this was sort of the cover page of a little pamphlet that they created to help influence people with vaccine hesitancy. And this life is sacred, keep our tri tribes safe and alive. Those were messages that they created. They helped. We need an elder. We need an elder on this because those are the folks that are most vulnerable. Hummingbirds are an important symbol in that culture. Um, the corn, and they wanted Denver in the background. So there's Denver. Um, so really, really cool. This is another example. This one came from the San Luis Valley. They were interested in tying into the Dia de los Muertos holiday, um, which celebrates the dead. They said, you know, we want to honor the folks who have passed because of COVID by preventing, by prevention. Let's, let's prevent unnecessary deaths. So they wanted to use a Calavera image. Our media designer put little COVID viruses around the eyes, which you probably can't see in the back, but very creative. These were cards that were handed out at events, health fairs, et cetera. Each of them had a fact on the front. And then on the back, there was a story from a community member about how COVID had impacted them. So again, this expertise on both sides really, really drove us. We were able to, on our side, bring in expertise in science and methods. Our community partners brought in their expertise and knowledge of their culture, language, and values. And together we created stuff like this and, and navigated this complexity. This uh, came from our urban uh, Latino Hispanic group, both here in Denver and in uh, Pueblo. This actually went on the side of RTD buses. Um, and again, this notion of capacity building, because we were using community connectors. We, we trained those folks. Our community data collectors, Comerb, worked with us to train them in human subjects research so that they could go in with a survey and know about data protection and all of that stuff. Um, we've built capacity in terms of our boot camp translation, how to transform scientific concepts into things that will be understandable and relevant for community members. We've had people that really didn't think they had much to contribute who now are community leaders in their community through this capacity building, which has been super rewarding. So I wanna talk a little bit about infrastructure. Um, we couldn't have done this by just starting from scratch. We had some infrastructure to build on thanks to CCTSI and our community engagement work. And I think that, you know, infrastructure for community engagement is just like infrastructure for any other kind of research, whether it's bench research, clinical trials, you name it. You need some infrastructure. You need stuff that's in place because you can't just snap your fingers when the snub funding comes in and get all that going. A few years back, we did this paper um, based on some surveys and interviews that we did with PCORI pilot grant awardees. So this was PCORI's first grant program. And um, some really interesting stuff came out of that. So these were domains that, that we collapsed things into as a result of the surveys. Most important thing that came out of that, connections and relationships. You gotta have infrastructure that supports that, supports those connections and relationships. And that gets back to this notion of being longitudinally involved with the community. There, there are engagement skills. There are, are methods that it's important to know how to do and having a way to um, leverage those is really important. A culture, an institutional culture that supports engagement. Um, longitudinal non-study dependent engagement activities. Again, that longitudinal concept. Um, interestingly enough, funding and resources was kind of at the bottom, but still important. 
um, but training policies and procedures that support this work. Um, you know, one policy that we deal with all the time is how can you actually pay community members from the university? We've had to get creative around some of that work as well. And this is one of the quotes from the interviews that I really like, which is, they said, the position that we take, which is very countercultural, is the question shouldn't be, how do you engage the community in your research? But how do you as researchers get involved in what the community is doing? They're already doing stuff. How do you get yourself at the table where everybody else is bringing their various skills to bear on how to improve population health in the community? So that it clashes with the traditional culture on this individual's campus, and I'm sure on many others in NIH. Nice quote. So I'm gonna wrap up here with just a little bit of an overview of our infrastructure at CCTSI, which um, is available to all of you, and I hope you'll take advantage of. Um, this is our website, which um, is pretty easy to find. If you go to cctsi.cuanschutz.edu, we're one of the drop downs. Um, and we worked over this past uh, year to do some work to define our core competencies, because we thought that was important to sort of, there's a lot of folks doing engagement work on campus. We're not the only ones, but here's what we think we're good at. Whoops. Growing and building trusting relationships. Really, really important. Um, we've got a 15 year history of doing that, engaging and sustaining these relationships. Um, we're also really good at developing partnerships. So supporting relationships between communities and academics to co-develop, co-implement, co-disseminate translational research, um, a really important competency. And then finally, training, coaching, and mentoring. We've been doing that for a long time too, and we think that's a core competency. So just briefly, our programs, we have a quarterly campus community engagement forum. Hopefully you recognize that from stuff that goes out on email. That's really intended to be a place where if you're not sure this stuff is for you, you can come, listen, see if you wanna get involved, or if you're already doing this work, come and share what you're doing, share your ideas. Um, we do consultations, both individual and we have a full standing consults committee. So if you're thinking about doing some work in the community, we can, have a place where you can come talk about that. We can help you think about how to get started. Training, we have our um, annual Colorado Immersion Program and Community Engagement, which is really designed for investigators that are just starting this work. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to be a junior investigator. We've had some senior folks as well jump in to that, which has been really fun. Research readiness training for community. Community organizations need some help to know how to engage with us. Um, so that's what that's all about. And finally, through our grant that's gonna be starting um, next month, we're gonna be developing community engagement training for research staff. So if that's of interest. We have a pilot grant program, it's two tiered. First tier partnership development. So you have time and funding both for you and for a community organization to meet, to pay for that over nine months to see if you can develop some ideas together about how you wanna work. And then if you're successful, we offer joint pilot funding for 12 months to actually pilot something in the community. Both include extensive coaching. So summing up, we're good. <laughs> um, so I think this, Virchow, you know, a long time ago came up with this notion of social medicine. I think it's still relevant, probably more relevant than ever today. Complexity, I think that's a useful concept to think about how do we approach wicked problems. Kinefin, I like because it helps me to orient where I'm at in the space. Hope it's helpful for you as well. And then community engagement and health equity really being deeply linked and intertwined. I don't think you can, we can approach health equity without engaging with our community partners. And then finally, the infrastructure is so important. 
last slide, final connection to Virchow. So back to his quote about all cells come from cells. I was thinking about this and I thought, well, cells, cells rarely are just off on their own. Cells are connected to one another. They thrive through their connections to other cells in their environment. That's what helps nurture them and sustain them. Same thing for this work. Advancing social medicine, health equity, means that we need to be connected as well. And with that, I'm gonna stop, see if we've got any questions or comments. That was excellent, thank you very much. Uh, we'll throw things open uh, to the room first. And while we're waiting for questions from the room, the uh, one I wanted to start with is, I guess the big question I'm gonna ask is how do you define the term community? And what I'm thinking is communities are so heterogeneous. Uh, and I imagine there are people with different beliefs inside each of these communities. How do you, how do you think about that? That is a really good question. And thank you for bringing that up because I think it's a stumbling block for a lot of folks. Um, what the CDC says in their principles of a community engagement is they talk about communities being self-defined. So what's that mean? Well, what it means is, you know, when I go down to the San Luis Valley, you know, obviously folks will say, yeah, we're San Luis Valley residents, but they might also say, you know, I live in Costilla County and we've got these issues. So there's a, there's a sub community there. There are communities of Latinos. There's this community of Canobal speakers. So it's really, it's, it's again, another one of these, you have to probe a little bit um, using the kind of framework um, to understand, okay, you all that I'm meeting with, tell me how you define your community. You know, just if we take the people in this room, we have the community of folks here on Anschutz, but then we also, all of us belong to other communities as well. So it's, yeah. I don't know if that's helpful, hopefully. Oh, yeah, thank you. Don, Don, this was great. Thank you for a lovely talk. I loved how you went from the biomedical to the organizational management sphere and then to the actual real world practice. You know, I was thinking about this from the lens of CBPR yeah. and, and really trying to think about the communities I've been involved with where the challenge becomes not the engagement necessarily, but the sustainment of that engagement, right? Because by definition, we, we come in as researchers, almost as outsiders with the sense of wanting to study something which has a timeline attached to it uh, by definition. One of the things that strikes me as, as very powerful about your model is that you have this sort of uh, long-standing relationship to start with with some of these communities, but also have the ability to bring in multiple people at different stages to re-engage through time to time. I'd love you to just talk about the sustainment piece of this because uh, I find that to be the most fascinating uh, and also perhaps the hardest thing to scale yeah. uh, in terms of relationships between the academics and then the, the real people on the ground. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I think um, the way I think about this is number one, um, I, I always try to be upfront with a community that there's gonna be ebbs and flows of grant funding that's gonna, that stuff is gonna come and go. Um, and when we have grant funding, our activity may ramp up a little bit. When, it, grant, when we're in between grants, the activity may look a little different. Um, it may mean that, you know, I'm coming to, to talk um, a little less frequently, but we're having different kinds of conversations about, we're, we're now in a project development phase because I want to engage folks at that level so that we can help write the grant for the next level of funding. The other thing that I think is also helpful is just to use the San Luis Valley as an example, I'm not the only one working there. Um, and what I've worked really hard to do is not only maintain my connections with folks there, but with other folks here on this campus that are also working there so that 
I can help connect those kinds of dots as well. Um, one of our partners down there, um, guy who runs the local boys and girls club, one, one time when I was down there, we were having dinner and he said, Don, we love it when you come down. It's, we wish you could come more often. Um, but said, I got to tell you, you know, I'm taking time for my family to come have dinner with you tonight. Next week, there'll be somebody else from Anschutz. And the week after that, there might be somebody else. Can you guys do a better job of coordinating? And he was absolutely right. Um, and so that really pushed me to say, okay, you're, you're absolutely right, Aaron. Um, let me do a better job of connecting up here. And what that also means is that, you know, when my funding may be at an ebb, Jen Leiferman's over in the School of Public Health, her funding may be ramping up. And okay, I can, I can be involved at that with that piece of work. Um, yeah. Another question. When you met, there was a really, that last quote you put up there was very powerful about sort of changing our paradigm of expert researchers who are going to go into community research versus experts in something who are going to go find out what the community needs. Does your group or similar groups ever go out into the community sort of with a blank slate and say, here we are as experts, you know, because I mean, even the vaccine hesitancy idea was you had a goal at the end. Yeah. You were hoping that there were more vaccines in arms than there were prior to your intervention. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we try to do that on a regular basis, even when we're in the middle of a, of a project. Like I mentioned that we're starting our third year of SEAL funding, which is great. And this, this, we learned last fall that um, NHLBI was going to open the door a little bit and say, "We're not. You don't have to focus on COVID. You know, find out from your communities what their priorities are." And so we started a process back then. Of it's been really interesting. They've really coalesced around cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and mental health across five different communities. It's been so interesting. Um, and so what we're working on now is, okay, there are intersections across those topics. How can we weave that together into something across these communities? I'm Ron. Um, can you talk a little bit about assessing the impact um, and some of the nuances, lessons learned there, especially in circumstances where randomization, a perfect control group may not be available? How do you go about uh, with these limitations in place? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, th these, are, these are not controlled clinical trials oftentimes. And so assessing impact is, is we have to think about different ways of doing that. And what we've been doing, again, I'll use SEAL as an example, is um, because we were using these community data collectors, we were able to establish a longitudinal cohort in each of our five partner communities. And so we've been, we've been serially surveying them so we can watch over time how attitudes are changing, what the impact has been on vaccine hesitancy, trust, those kinds of things. So it's, we don't have a control group, but, but we're tracking this, these same individuals over time. So that's one thing that we've done. The other thing that we've been doing is looking at what's the spread of the information, the products that we've been creating, what's been the spread of that into the community. And if somebody saw that on the side of an RTD bus, were they more likely to get vaccinated? Um, we've measured that in our surveys as well. Um, and again, that NAM report that I mentioned, that also has some really good resources for measuring impacts and looking at this in terms of quantitative survey measures. And then ultimately, I think what's really, really important is getting in there and listening to the stories. I mean, there's, there's definitely qualitative 
there's a mixed methods aspect to this that is so important in terms of tell me what the impact was. Um, you know, um, we've heard lots and lots of those kinds of stories as well. Sometimes harder to, to kind of get and, and harvest those, but those are really important too. And, and feeding those back to folks. Dr. Rahm. Thank you so much for coming and for all of the engagement that you've done with the communities in Colorado. Um, one of my questions, switching gears just a little bit, is um, I think there's been a rise in the use of community advisory boards to guide like medical education, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Could you speak a little bit to that and kind of any best practices or experience that you've had in terms of incorporating that into the decisions we make about who we accept, but also how we teach people to become doctors? Wow, that's that's a that's a real, that's a big topic. Um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, particularly as uh, a public institution, I think that's really, really important that we're getting that kind of input. Um, I think, you know, some of the folks that have done a really nice job of that on our campus include um, the folks that have been developing the service learning curriculum uh, for the school that, you know, developed a community panel to find out, okay, how should this work? What should it look like? You know, you know that as much better than I do. Um, and I think that we need to do more of that. I'm currently sitting on a task force that's looking at promotion and tenure requirements and how can we um, make those more friendly to folks doing community engagement. One of the ideas that's bubbled up in that group is so is that we should encourage both at the departmental and school level opening up so that community members can have input on what a faculty member's impact has been in the community. And that that's, that's an important metric. Um, I think that'd be so cool. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, and of course there's a whole, there's a whole, topic we could spend another hour talking about in terms of how do you form an advisory board and all of that. Um, yeah, a lot of stuff to unpack there as well. But, you know, what we found is that um, we like to talk about engaging um, the unusual suspects uh, in communities um, or what we like to call them free range humans. Uh, so, you know, not necessarily the identified community leaders, but you know, talk to a community leader and say, who do you know in your community that might be interested in this? You're busy. You know, is there a mom? Is there a school teacher? Is there, you know, a housekeeper that, you know, might be willing to spend some time with us? Because um, those voices can be so valuable. Yeah. My question had to do with kind of in a world where we're seeing kind of like decreasing reimbursements, shorter clinic visits, kind of a less emphasis on community health and like primary care. Um, and knowing that we as physicians have limited time and energy um, with kind of additional constraints put upon us every day, where do you feel you've had the most success kind of pushing back against these ideas and trying to get more NIH grant funding to maintain kind of a sustainable level of of consistency, of, of kind of increasing that idea that community health and social determinants of health are important? Is it, is it at hospital administrative levels? Is it state government, national government? Like where have you seen the most success? Yeah, I mean, I think over the last three to five years, there've been huge changes in NIH in terms of the amount of funding opportunities, um, if you're not familiar with it, NIH has launched this Compass program that really flips the model on its head where, you know, they're actually primarily funding community organizations. And, oh, by the way, we want you to have a university partner, but you're the primary grant recipient. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting stuff going on at NIH. I think for our health systems, I like to point, I like to 
point to the work that is being done by the Lown Institute and the Wright Care Alliance that's, you know, really promoting this notion of, you know, the accountability that we should have to communities. I think that's gaining more and more prominence. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I like to think that we're, we're making strides. There's still the financial drivers and pressures. And that's where I think, you know, this Virchow is going back to Virchow, his notion that, you know, politics or medicine writ large, we really need the policy makers help here too, um, to with some of those financial issues and work on that side. Great, I think we are right at time. So Dr. Nice, thank you very much for being here today. Really appreciate the talk. Thank you all.